everybody. Let's stand to the, our feet and let's worship the Lord this morning. He's the king of all and the only one deserving of the crown of glory. Let's put our hands together. Amen.
remain standing to watch Believer's Baptism. Good morning, Pastor Brian. Good morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. We are so thankful that you chose to worship with us at Grace this morning. And we have seen a lot of baptisms over the last three weeks. Um, and we're just so excited for what God is doing here. And so I'm here with my friend Layla. And Layla has something she would like to share with you all. I'm Layla and Jesus is my Lord. Amen. Layla, because of your profession of faith, I baptize you as my sister in Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. This is Layla's sister, Lydia, and she also has something she'd like to share. My name is Lydia, and Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Lydia, because of your profession of faith, I baptize you as my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. Good job. This is Luke. Luke came and prayed to receive Christ in my office not too long ago, and he's ready to be baptized this morning. So Luke, go ahead. My name's Luke, and Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Luke, because of your profession of faith, I baptize you as my brother in Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. I'll tell you, it's almost like a part of the Jordan River has been rerouted through Carnes. Yeah, Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, it's great to see everybody this morning. Real quick, we always want to let our guests know that uh, we do something special every Sunday, uh, mainly just for you. And what that is, is beyond these double doors to my left, and we dismiss the service. Pastor Bobby and Miss Cindy will be there at a uh, kiosk, and they would love to meet you and, uh, and pray with you and talk with you. Uh, they also have a, a gift for you. And they present a gift in your honor for being here. So guests, be sure you take advantage of that. As always, Grace members, family, this is open to you as well. But we always want to make sure we let those guests go first, okay? All right, let's continue to worship the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer together right now. Lord Jesus, uh, thank you for allowing us access to the Father. Lord, the veil was torn. The earth shook. Lord God, even the dead were raised in the power, God, of the death of Christ and the power of the resurrection that burst forth from the tomb. Lord God, that very power you said is within us through your spirit. Lord God, you have been so incredibly good to us and we overlook you so often. I know I do. We ask you, God, God, please forgive me of doing that because every good thing comes from you. You are a good, good father. In the good times and the bad times, you are faithful. You will never leave us. And so, Lord, as we continue to sing this song, I pray, Lord God, you will receive it. And I pray, Lord, as your church, that we, we would lift this up in a faithful, authentic, and grateful way. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Let's sing this song together. I think we most know it. Most of us know it, 10,000 Reasons, which is really kind of an underestimate, don't you think? Let's sing. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. i 
Amen. Hey, you may be seated. And we're going to do something really special right now. Love doing this on a cage. We're going to have a men's quartet come up. And uh, just a wonderful, wonderful song. Many of you may know this song. It is a great uh, story of something that actually happened. The characters um, are being kind of uh, uh, interpreted here. But it's a great, great, exciting song. So come on up, guys, and let's be blessed. Amen. Just a baby, still he longed to become a normal man. Now we don't know much about the men that carry the corners of his tiny bed that day. But if we may create a demonstration, we'll see what these men might have had to say. Suppose that first man said, I hate to doubt it, for Jesus touched my eyes when I was blind. are more serious than mine. Suppose that second man said no need to bother. This man's condition will remain the same. Though Jesus touched my hand when it was withered, I don't believe he can heal a man so lame. Suppose that third man said I hate to question, but no one here is more skeptical than me. Though Jesus touched me when I was a leper, this helpless man will never walk, you see. Then every eye was turned to the fourth man to see how he might criticize and doubt. But all three men were startled with amazement. That fourth man stopped and said his name out loud. sang that last note at the bottom and earthworms sort of popping up out of the ground. <laughs> go fishing. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Father, wow, we thank you, Lord, for, <laughs> for life. God, we thank you for eternal life. We thank you, Lord, for sending your son. Jesus, we thank you for the pain that was afflicted upon you and you still fought, um, 
sought to, fought the, uh, to complete the Father's will. Lord, you, you could have called legions of angels to pull you from the cross. We cannot imagine that kind of pain. Even to where you shout, Father, why have you forsaken me? But you stayed. And fa Father, we, uh, we know, Lord God, that your will is that we live for you out of adoration, God, of you. And God, we pray that one of the ways we do that, uh, the main way we can do that, God, is to be in your word, learn from it. And God, I pray your hand to be on Pastor Bobby, Lord, as he delivers your word right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> hey, fellas, I discovered if you wear paisley, you can sing a little bit higher, okay? Just a little bit of counsel for you if uh, you're wondering what to wear. Take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews 13. Always watching. We'll come back to that in a moment. I do want us to be praying, though. Uh, if you saw on the news last night, there have been some failed drone and missile strikes on Israel. Uh, as I said in the first hour, folks, God has a plan for the place and God has a plan for the people. They are, by the way, not default saved if they don't trust Jesus, okay? Jews don't automatically get a pass, but many Jews will be saved, we know, in and through rapture and uh, tribulation. So what we need to do is we need to pray for the people and pray for the place and pray for protection over all who are innocent. So just to throw that out there, we want to be uh, mindful of what's going on in our world. I just had a friend get back from Israel, and thank God he did because they've shut down domestic and international travel, at least as of last night. So continue to pray for the people and the place. You know, it's amazing that in three weeks, when we had, uh, three weeks ago, we had the canvas up here on Palm Sunday and did the, the spray paint. I was so blessed today. One of our members told me his great-granddaughter did that on some kind of toy thing she had, but she did that whole drawing by memory. I've been so blessed to hear the stories. I've seen some come out of GCA. Some kids made that, a replica of that in Play-Doh. Um, that's when you know you're a simple drawer, when they can replicate it in Play-Doh, which is good. It's exactly what we wanted. But in these three weeks, we've witnessed about 80 people say yes to Christ and be obedient to follow him in believer's baptism. That is an amazing thing for God to do in three weeks' time. Um, you know, I remember in our first church, my first pastor, it's celebrating that first year of 25 baptisms. Now, the church was considerably smaller, of course, but I remember being so elated that 25 people would say yes to Jesus and follow him in baptism across that year, and we've seen more than three times that in three weeks. That being said, though, I'm mindful that in Luke 15, when one lost sheep is saved, when one person who is lost and away from God's fold uh, responds to the good shepherd and is found, when one who was blind can see, there's all kinds of rejoicing going on through the halls of heaven. So imagine God's pleasure with his church when we get serious about seeing men and women and boys and girls come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I don't know why else we would be here. I don't know why else we would want to be a, a church unless we're making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. This entire series that we're going to be finishing in the next few weeks is called Hebrews, an anchor for the soul. And in a culture where everything's sort of up and down and and it seems chaotic. The stock market will be up 500 points and down 500 points. And if you have investments, you probably don't even want to look at stuff. The point being is that the world is changing very, very rapidly. But I'm so thankful for the truth of Hebrews 13.8. Now, y'all already know it, but let's say it again. Get this way down deep beyond your mind into your heart, right? Let's say it. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That ought to give you a sense of confidence and hope that when everything else is changing, when the foundations itself of this world seem to be rocking and rolling, Jesus is the same. You know, we, we talked a lot about the sort of the, the set of this, so I won't repeat all of that, but basically at the end here, paranesis means the writer is giving us a don't forget this, don't forget that, don't forget this. These are important. The main thing is don't leave Jesus to go back to some ritualistic religion. You need a relationship with God through Christ. Don't leave the relationship for the religion. I know it's hard. I know Nero's lighting some of you guys on fire to burn his candles in his garden. I know the persecution is great. I know times are tough, but don't go backwards. Stay firm. Move forward. Look at the great council of witnesses that have gone on before us. Remember that God's got this. And now he's saying, and don't forget this, and don't forget that. Because there is a vertical aspect. God is always watching. Now that can either make you fearful, or that can make you faithful. 
And, and I want it to make you faithful. I don't want you to cower in fear and say, oh, no, God's always watching. He is always watching. They were picking on me in the green room this morning because there was a spider on the floor. I don't do spiders. They are clearly from Satan. And so uh, a sweet lady grabbed it with a napkin and threw it away. My wife wasn't quick enough. Normally that's her job for the last 30 years. But they, they threw it away and they started laughing and they said, oh, I bet there's a camera in here that caught all that. And sure enough, in the corner of that room right there, there's a camera watching everything you do. It's being recorded. Well, the thing is... God has always been watching. From the moment of your conception, when life began in your mama's womb, and then God was knitting you and fashioning you, he knew all of your days written in his book before you lived in one. He knows the thoughts you think before they go through your mind and the words you speak. And yet God in his sovereignty lets us have freedom and the power of moral choice. And so he allows us to live this life with great freedom, but under his watchful eye. The, the heresy of deism said God is the great watchmaker. He creates the watch, he winds it up, and then he steps out and lets the universe unwind on its own. That is not true. God did create it all. God did wind it up and get it all going, but God is intimately involved in the details of our life. He knows everything, and that's wonderful. But also there's not only the vertical aspect, there's the horizontal aspect. Other folks really are watching. They are paying attention to the way we act and the way we react and the way we respond. We don't recoil from that as Christians. What does it even mean to be a disciple of Jesus? It means a student. It means a follower. People are watching. If we say we're a Christian, they're watching if we're really like Jesus. And as soon as we're not, because all of us sin at times and fall short of his glory, but as soon as we're not, we get that hypocrisy finger pointed at us. But the reality is we all have stuff we're dealing with. The Bible says first remove the plank from your own eye, then you'll see clearly to help your brother remove the speck from his eye. We all got it. We've all got our fair share of planks and specks. The point of this message is there are some key truths you need to know because there's either good or bad as a result of how we respond to God's truth. That being said, stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. I'll quickly repeat the first two points from last week in case you missed those. But let's roll through one to six. It says, let brotherly love continue. So love those in the family of faith. Don't, don't be hurting on people that are brothers and sisters in Christ. That word is Philadelphia, brotherly love. Do not forget to entertain strangers. So don't just be good to the folks you know. Be good to the foreigner, the stranger. For by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. We entertain angels unaware. It's not prescriptive, it's descriptive. You never know who God may put in your path. You don't know if that lady on the side of the road with the flat tire might be a being from God to see where you are in your walk. I, I'm not saying that's, don't look for angels around every corner, but please know there's an unseen spiritual realm that is always active around us. You can reread Ephesians 6 to read about that. But he says, look, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. We went over that last week. We'll repeat in a moment and review. But now we look at this fresh material. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Man, you just couple that truth with Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's a lot of good truth right there. And therefore, because he'll never leave us nor forsake us, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Heavenly Father, thank you for these promises. Thank you for these exhortations. Thank you even for these warnings, Lord. May we hear and obey for your glory. And then for your glory, we know it will ultimately be for our good as well. Thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Be seated. We said last week, consistently show love and hospitality. You never know who God may put in your path. Love the brother, love the stranger. Remember we talked about the pastor in India that was even rejoicing over the privilege to suffer for the Lord. We said love is action, and so um, God is watching. Angels, 
maybe it, we may be entertaining angels unaware, just be sure, be certain that you demonstrate the love of Christ consistently. The Bible's very clear. They'll know. Those outside will know that we're Christians by our love one for another. Second truth, consider those who are suffering and in bondage. You, if you're a Christian, you're part of the body of Christ. I was working out in the yard the other day. Should have stopped. Should have put jeans and long sleeves on because I had to go down into the woods. I'd cut down a tree and needed to cut it up and drag it in. The problem was I didn't want to stop, so I ran through there, briars and other things. Man, I'm, <laughs> look, I'm in bad shape. Cut up and scarred up, and I got all kinds of stuff going on right now. But it's interesting how you do all that work, and if, let's say, you, you cut this arm or your, your back is sore, everything kind of pays the price, especially now that I'm approaching the mid-century mark in the next little bit. Um, Every, you know, your check engine light comes on a lot quicker these days. And so it's just one part of the body hurts. Think about that. If there are Christians, believers that are suffering, we need to be empathetic. We need to go with that and say, you know what, how can we love them well? How can we help them? How can we minister to them? Then he shifts gears. The writer here now gives us something that seems disconnected, but I would say it's still a, a gospel matter and he says like this verse 4 marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled but fornicators and adulterers God will judge so I've written it like this honor your marriage covenant lest you experience God's judgment now notice how I didn't make that up I didn't get cute nor creative I just simply told you with few words this is what the truth of God's word says. Four says it's honorable. We got to keep the marriage bed undefiled, meaning we don't bring in others into that space. And he says, fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Marriage is one of the purest, most powerful pictures of the gospel. And so the exposition of brotherly love and even stranger kindness leads us to the picture of marital love. Marriage should be honored we uphold it with moral righteousness and accountability. I want you to listen to one commentator's assessment. His name is Thomas Lee. I've read Dr. Lee's works for years. I didn't realize a buddy of mine, Cliff, down in Florida, is actually his son. We were in a conference a little while back, and Cliff was talking about his dad and a lot that he's written, and I thought, man, that's interesting. I know Thomas, Dr. Lee, dean of theology, the school of theology, and a New Testament professor years ago at Southwestern. And Dr. Lee said this, God's promise of judgment for those who practice sexual immorality, becomes an incentive for the practice of purity by those who acknowledge divine sovereignty. Paul's warning to those who practice immorality and idolatry was that God's wrath comes to those who practice such things. That's Ephesians 5, 5 and 6. So I want you to stop and think about this for a minute. Those who practice sexual immorality may escape human disapproval. Because today, I mean, it's sort of a given. Well, yeah, of course, people are going to sleep around, they're going to do their thing, but in the end, although they may escape human disapproval, in the end, they'll find that none other than God himself will be their judge. So it doesn't matter what others think or say, God is the standard. His word is the metric, the, the canon of right and wrong. And a Christian home begins with a Christian marriage. This means loyalty, it means purity. This means that sex outside of marriage is both sinful and destructive. Sex within the protective bonds of marriage is enriching and glorifying to God. I would argue it is an act of worship before the Lord. Let's unpack the terms real quick in case you're not familiar. You probably are. But fornication is committed by unmarried persons. Typically, that's the word we use. Adultery is committed by married persons, bringing those things into the marriage that don't belong. Now, fornication can also mean basically any kind of sexual sin. But how does God judge fornicators and adulterers? Well, sometimes, according to Romans 1, in their own bodies. Sometimes there can be sickness, disease, and other things in their own bodies. We're not in the place of God. We can't say with an absolute certainty that this came from that, but the Bible does say in Romans 1, 24 to 27, that he'll judge the body. Then there's a final judgment coming. Uh, Romans 21, 8, Romans 22, 15, all of these are in your notes. I want you to think about this. David committed adultery. David also fornicated. David with Bathsheba, when he took her, another man's wife, and lay with her, and she became pregnant. He entered into this horrible, horrible 
series of sins because it eventually led to the, the murder of her husband. David was forgiven. So if you're here today and you've fallen in sexual sin, know that God is more than able and ready and willing to forgive if you truly repent. Change your mind, change your direction on all of that. God is more than able to forgive. However, though God forgave David, who paid the ultimate price? I I would argue that probably David is one example of somebody who had the harshest or hardest judgment on that kind of sin Because it wasn't just David that suffered. David still was a great king. David was a great leader. But his children suffered greatly because of his choices. Do you realize that his infant son died? The son of adultery with Bathsheba died. But David got up. He continued to worship the Lord. He said, look, he'll not come back to me, but I'll go to be with him. Because babies that die are safe in the arms of the Lord Jesus. The Bible gives us plenty of evidence that They're before that age of moral accountability, and so they're taken to be with the Lord. But David's sons that did survive, you know the story of Absalom, I'm sure, they paid a very, very high price. And there was a lot of sexual sin that would follow in that family because David tried to cover up. Rather than open up and say, look, I've done this and I've fallen, he did it eventually, but at first he tried to cover it up. And in our day when sexual sins are paraded as harmless entertainment all around us, the church should stand for the purity of the marriage bond and the marriage bed. A dedicated Christian home really is the nearest thing to heaven on earth. It's the nearest thing to the best picture of the gospel, and we, the church, should stand for it very clearly. We don't have to talk about it in any perverse, twisted, weird manner. You know there's plenty of sexual sin to go around. And the church has for many, many years, unfortunately, looked at a small group of people. Now there are so many letters, I don't know what they all are, but let's say LGBTQ+, and we've said, oh no, that's sin, that's wrong. And the Bible is very clear that we've been right on that. However, we've been very wrong in failing to say, by statistics, there's far more heterosexual sin going on around us. And we don't want to talk about that. We don't want to talk about people living together and almost invariably fornicating when they do so. And I want to tell you something about that. Here at Grace Baptist Church, we take this seriously. And if you're in a situation where you're involved in this kind of sin, come to us and let us help you set it right. Don't just go and and say, I'm just going to shack up and live together because that's what everybody's doing. Do, do it God's way and be married in a covenant before God. You say, well, I don't know if it's the right person. It's not about finding the right person, man. It's about being the right person. Get this Hollywood notion of soulmate out of your head. Get this sleepless in Seattle on top of the Empire State Building garbage out of your noggin. It ain't really working in Hollywood, and it doesn't work in real life. Be the right person and do the right thing. Do you know our pastors regularly engage in helping people do the right thing? Even if they've had kids, even if they've been living together a long time, we want them to to, to be blessed by the covenant bond of marriage. And it is different. As I said in the first service, no offense, sweet ladies, but you've all probably heard the phrase, why would the guy buy the cow when he gets the milk for free? You've probably heard that, right? And the reality is, this living together thing, it is not only bad for you in the eyes of God, fornicating is not only bad for you in the eyes of God, much less adultery, which I think we know that would be horrifically bad in the eyes of God, but you're missing God's great blessing of marriage. And you know, it's, it's why not set it right? Pastors and counselors are ready and available. A lot of churches are hiding their pastoral staffs now. You can't even directly email anybody. You can get on our website and you can go to every single pastor on this team and talk to us directly. You can reach out to us a myriad of ways and we will try to help you do this the right way. I'm telling you guys, I thought it was good 29 years ago, almost 30 years ago when I met her, but 29 years ago when I married her, I thought it was amazing. But our marriage is even so much better Because we invest in one another, Miss Cindy and I protect one another from our online accounts and passwords to phone access. Y'all, she knows where I'm at all the time. Now, admittedly, sometimes I go out for a lunch meeting and she'll text me and say, how is Chili's today? And it's a little creepy because she's watching on the GPS. I mean, it's a little weird. 
But, but we share everything, all access, all the time, because she's looking out for me, and I'm looking out for her, and we protect one another, and we invest in one another. She had a great time at the women's retreat along with our daughters, and then Bobby and I had a great time doing some hunting and fishing, and we got back together yesterday. Well, guess what? We went out on a date. We went out to have a nice meal, and then what every good date has to end in. We went to Walmart. You got to do that. So we had us a date, and... We, we, we invest in one another. Marriage is about, about these things, and it's covenant. It's not just living together. It's not just taking a test ride. It's like folks that are visiting the church, and I say, well, how long have you been visiting, Grace? Well, 15 years. Man, marry us already. Come on. Beyonce, put a ring on it. Let's go. What are you waiting on? Give up the guest parking place and let somebody else park there, bub. It's time to commit. Commit already, Right? like that line in Elf, give her the ring, man. Let's go, let's get serious. And you say, but what if it's not right? Statistically, you are far worse off living with someone and taking a test ride. Do you know that? Statistically, you have far greater propensity to problems and even divorce. You need to do it God's way. We know that God blesses it done God's way. So steer clear of these things lest you face the judgment of God and make investments, those of you that are married. Enjoy the wife of your youth, Proverbs says. So if I am sick, if I'm down, if things are tough, and I need a withdrawal from my marriage account, if I need a love withdrawal, if I need something, if I have not been investing, and my sweet Cindy has not been investing, then when one of us or both of us really needs it, it's not there. And so we are regularly investing, depositing, spending time, enjoying one another. And I think, again, it's not to say it's perfect. We still argue there are times when she wants to knock my head off. I told you a couple years ago, she got so mad at me playing foosball one night, she looked at me and said, I hate your face. I don't know why she said that. I mean, you know, I can make her crazy, and your spouse can make you crazy, but it's the best kind of crazy. It's a glorious kind of crazy. It's a wonderful thing to know we know one another so well, and I'm praying if God's given us this long, maybe he'd give us 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or whatever he gives us. I can tell you this with no doubt in my mind. I will love this woman, and I will be in a gospel covenant with her till death do us part. I will be with her and she will be with me because there's so much that's been built, not just four kids and two grandkids and a home and ministry, but there's so much more than that. You need a covenant, God-honoring marriage. And if you're out there today and you're unsure, respond. Come and talk to us. And there's no sin that's so grievous it's kept that will keep you from God. Other than blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which as I explained in the first hour, you grant, um, you, you say that things that Jesus does actually are works of Satan and you deny the witness of the Holy Spirit as to who Jesus is. If you deny Jesus and you do that until you die, well, you'll be forever separated from him. God will give you exactly what you want. No God. He'll give you a horrible, horrible eternity in hell apart from the Lord. But... Apart from that, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, if you'll trust God, and you can be reborn even in your sexual area. So please, please set it right. Don't just keep doing what the culture is doing. Do it God's way. Secondly, be, or it's actually number four on your outline, be content and confident in Christ. This helps you avoid the sin of covetousness, and we'll unpack that. Be content and confident in Christ. This helps you avoid the sin of covetousness. So five and six says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so we may boldly so. So here's our confidence. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? This idea here of covetousness is from two words in Greek. Philos, we've already talked about, like Philadelphia. And Argos, this idea of silver, it's literally lover of silver with an A in front of it. So no lover of silver. We often translate that not greedy for filthy lucre or no lover of money. And then it gets broader in the New Testament to basically mean if anything, 
if any material thing, money, stuff, if anything gets on the throne, that's a problem. That's covetousness. Covetousness means more than love of money, but it certainly starts with that. It's the desire for more or the desire for what we don't have. I want you to think about this. In God's top 10, the big 10 commandments, the number 10 commandment is, thou shalt not covet. He gets specific to thy neighbor's wife or the things that thy neighbor has, but thou shalt not covet means, look, material things will never fully satisfy. How many of you have lived long enough to know it doesn't matter how nice the stuff is, at some point, the stuff doesn't satisfy. Anybody else? The stuff doesn't satisfy. I have been by many, many deathbeds. As I told them in the first service, five different times I've prayed, and during the prayer, the person has passed away. So you probably don't want to call me to pray by your bed. I'm just going to tell you. I'm like the death angel coming through the door. But in all those cases, it was a relief to the family. There were families saying, you know, they've laid around suffering. It's been very tough. And I remember, I remember them all, but I remember the first one so vividly because it actually scared me. It scared me when I had come back from, uh, driven to seminary, come straight back, was praying with this family, 20-some people in the room, and the mother of the matriarch passed in that prayer, during that prayer. But of all the times I've been beside of deathbeds and countless other times, nobody, nobody has ever talked about their stuff. Nobody's ever said, let me show you this. It's always been the relationships, the people. There's been some regret at times for not spending the time as they should have with this person or that. But nobody's ever said, I wish I had more stuff. Time, family connection, of course, but let me also say, money and stuff is not the root of the problem. It's never been. Do you realize the Bible is full of examples of wealthy people that God chooses to tap and use for his glory? Do you realize that in the course of human history, we wouldn't have a fraction of what we have, particularly with higher education, with medical advancement, with a lot of things, we wouldn't have even a fraction of what we have were it not for philanthropic Christians, people that love God, that love the Lord Jesus, and give out of the abundance of their wealth. We are so blessed around the world because of people of faith that have given. And by the way, it is far, far, far more in Christianity than any other major world religion. You cannot find a major world religion that gives and helps people like Christianity and like Christian people. But it is not the wealth that's the problem. It's not the stuff that's the problem. In fact, Solomon prayed and God gave him great wisdom, the wisest man of his time, and yet God said, I'm also gonna give you the wealth. I'm also gonna bless you with a lot of money. And then, of course, there were other problems in his life, but the love of money... The love of stuff is the problem. 1 Timothy 6.10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. For some people eager for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Y'all seen like, uh, you, the, there's a show, something like The Lottery Ruined My Life. And I'm thinking, you just won 50 mil and it got worse for you? What's wrong with you? But it's priority. It's what do we put first? Who or what is first? Remember the rich young ruler, Matthew 19. He asked Jesus, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, he didn't get it right out of the gate. You don't do anything to inherit, right? But he said, what, what do I do, Jesus? And Jesus said, if you want to be perfect or mature, go sell what you have, give to the poor, then you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Now, was Jesus really saying meritorious uh, salvation, works-based? Hey, hey, rich man, do this, and you'll be saved. No, Jesus is saying, I know you're God. Jesus is saying, I know who's first in your life, and it's all of that stuff, and it's all of that wealth. And Jesus said, show me that I'm first. Go give that stuff away, and then you're ready to follow. But the rich young ruler, it says, he heard this saying, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The Bible says it's actually easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't mean the wealthy won't be there. Many, many, many wonderful, godly, wealthy people will be there. It is when the wealth becomes your God. It is when the stuff is more important than the Savior. And I want to make an offer to you right now. 
If you're struggling with this, if you say, you know what, money is too important to me, Cindy and I will volunteer to take 100, 200 grand off your hands just so you won't, I'm kidding. Uh, We will gladly bless you by taking that in the church. The point is this, though, and you, you know this if you've been here any length of time. I don't get up here and berate you over giving. I don't get up here and beat you over the head over supporting the work. What I often do is thank you because a person that wants to honor God starts by saying this thing that has such a draw, and it does for all of us. It does for all of us. This thing that has such a pull, you know what? The first of it, the first fruits of it go to my God. He gets it. Not because I think I'm earning his favor or salvation, but because number one, he says that he loves a cheerful giver. And number two, he said, if I sow sparingly, I reap sparingly. If I sow generously, I reap generously. And I think the best blessings from God don't come in some kind of financial uh, blessing, financial gifts, but God always outgives us. Whatever we do, God gives more and more and more. And, you know, seriously, seriously, think about what the Bible teaches on your stuff. We are stewards managers, everything in your wallet, everything in your bank account or investments, your kids, your career, your cars, your home, everything is the Lord's on loan for a little while. You say, how do you know that, Pastor? Because of all those deathbeds and all those funerals, nobody's ever taken one penny with them. Because something that's helped me my whole life, as long as I can remember, I've thought this way, our gold is God's asphalt. Now let that sit. The very best shiny, cool things we have that would be a picture of wealth will be walked on under your feet in glory. Our pearls and our jewels are his gates. Our gold is his asphalt. Don't put so much stock in the things where moth can come in and rust can destroy and people can take. Don't put so much stock in that. The material things of life can be decaying or stolen, but God, the Bible says, never leaves us nor forsakes us. What does that mean? Well, he told Moses that in Deuteronomy 31. He told Joshua that in Joshua 1. I've given you all these in your notes. And through Jesus Christ, we find that everything we need is there because God is there. I will never leave you nor forsake you. What's interesting in the phrase, if you read it in Greek, there are five negatives, five negatives used. So if I'm going to rewrite it, I'm going to say it this way with the five negatives. There's absolutely no way whatsoever I will never, ever leave you. That's what God tells you. And he says it in the Old Testament, and he says it again in the New Testament over and over and over. I will never, no, never, never, ever, ever leave you. He's better than all the worldly wealth because these are the things that matter. And so there's this affirmation of faith. And it comes in a combination of Psalm 118 and Psalm 27. It's a messianic psalm fulfilled in Christ. But it says this, I can know, I can have confidence, I can be sure because Jesus is my helper. I will not fear, I'm not worried. You see Nero's over here and he's lighting my family on fire and we're becoming candles in his garden. But I'm not going to fear man because ultimately God is with me. God will never leave me. What can man do to me? And I realize to be content is very easy to read and very difficult to practice. But true contentment never comes from possessing many things. It comes when we rest in Christ. Let me tell you how I know, not only from the truth of God's word I know this, but from traveling the world. I'm telling y'all, in the poorest places on planet Earth, in places that you, I can't even describe the sights and the smells, I cannot tell you how many times I've had to fight back, not only tears, which many times I haven't fought back, but literally an upset stomach from what I've seen and what I've witnessed. But among brothers and sisters, a contentment, a joy, without all of the bells and whistles and all of the accoutrement that we have, I've seen such a joy in worship. 
people that have had such an incredible spirit about them when they had absolutely nothing according to the world's standards. Nothing. And there's such a joy in their life. And then you look at the average sports star, Hollywood actor, actress. You look at how their family, so many, not all, but so, so, so many are tragically dysfunctional. And there's all manner of crazy. And this one's with this one now and then with that one there and then back to this one. And you see it, I see it, we all know it. And they got everything the world could ever promise them. The money, the fame, people that would just give anything to spend a little time with them. And yet their personal lives are so unbelievably tragic. You ever follow any of the stories of the greats? Elvis, Whitney, Michael Jackson. You ever follow any of the stories of the great entertainers? Do you know how tragic it is most of the time? Do you know how sad it is most of the time? Because at the end of the road of stuff is almost unbearable loneliness. And that's why there's this desire to fill that with other things. They may play good on the outside. Oh, it's God, it's God, it's God. But behind the curtain, and I would say, you know, since Christ is always with us, we have all that we will ever, ever need. And we have no reason to fear others because he is our helper and we are children of God. And when the children of God are in the will of God, obeying the word of God, they will never lack anything. And we cannot be harmed beyond this life. You could hurt my body. You could damage me physically, but you can't touch my spirit. You can't take my soul. It is saved and secured and sealed in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can't have it. And nobody can take yours either. Because when you know the Lord, you have no one and nothing to fear. You are more than a conqueror through him who loved you. What have we learned? Consistently show love and hospitality. You never, never know who God may put in your path. Consider those suffering and in bondage. Man, if the hand is hurting, the whole body hurts. Honor your marriage covenant, lest you experience God's judgment. Be content and be confident in Christ. It helps you avoid the sin of covetousness. You'll always find somebody that's got more than you, that's doing better than you, that's more this or more that than you. You'll always find somebody that's worse than you so that you can justify yourself. They're not as good as you. They don't have as much as you. Your standard is not the other guy. Your standard is the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And when you know he is your standard, you know that you need his mercy and grace. You know you've fallen short of him. You know you must come to him humbly and broken so that he can put you back together. I want to close with a clip. We started with the clip. Did we rewatch the clip in this service or just the first? Oh, you didn't see Roz again? You remember Roz from last week? Watching, always watching. You could do the voice, honey, if you want to come up and get a mic. No? Holly can do it really well. Yeah. So she's watching Wazowski, always watching. But I want to end with another clip. I showed it in the first. I forgot to reshow it. But if you haven't seen it, Monsters, Inc. There you go. I don't want you to walk out of here going, oh, no. Oh, no. And be paranoid. God is watching. Everybody else is watching. Yes, that's true. That's a wonderful thing. God's watching. He's got your back. He's got your front. He's got your sides. God's for you. He's with you. But he's not for you in the way Joel Osteen, since I picked on him in the first, I might as well pick on him in the second so that the snowflakes can write me in this service too. Joel Osteen likes to say, God is for you. He wants you to have the promotion. God is for you, but he may not want you to have the promotion. What God is for is his glory. And by the way, speaking of Pastor Joel, he's a motivational speaker and fine as a motivational speaker. But the reality is the kind of prosperity gospel that he's touting is simply not in line with what the word of God teaches. What the word of God teaches is your stuff is not as important as your savior. And if you try to rub a cosmic lamp the right way and get God to be your genie to give you what you want, and if your faith is just right, he'll pop up and give you all of that, you don't know the God of the Bible. You need to trust that God is with you. And God will be the God of the mountain, and God will be the God of the valley. 
And so this little video, I think, in just a minute or so, sums it up really, really well. Watch this. Pastor, you, you just don't know. You stand up there and you say all that. You don't know how hard it is. You don't know what I'm facing. You don't know how high the stack of bills are. Well, I know a fellow that had it just a wee bit worse than you. In fact, they wrapped this guy up in grave clothes and they put him in a tomb. I know two of them. One of them we sang about earlier. And you know, it looked like that was it. I mean, that's about as bad as it gets. This dude was really gone. But with a few words from the mouth of Jesus, Lazarus broke forth from death. And because you're sitting in this room, there's still hope. You're not there yet. You're not wrapped in burial clothes. You're not laid up in a tomb. And if God could bring forth Lazarus through Christ, and more than that, if Jesus Christ himself could be nailed to the old rugged cross and Jesus Christ himself could cry to tell us die, the victor's cry, it is finished, paid in full, and Jesus Christ himself could pay for all of your sin, past, present, and future, and Jesus Christ himself could say, why don't you just bring it to me? I know what you've done. I saw it when you did it. I know how far we are apart, but you can come home, and when you come home, the father will open his arms wide and hug your neck and take you in and you say but you don't know my sin but maybe you don't know my savior my savior is big enough to cleanse you of all unrighteousness what you need to do is surrender and you need to go and sin no more turn around stop trusting in your way and go his and stand in confidence, not fear, that our Father, His Son, and our Savior, the blessed Holy Spirit of the triune Godhead, is always watching. Stand with me this morning. As we go to our invitation, continue to pray for our Romania team that is working this week and coming home midweek. They're doing a great work there. I want to ask you to come today, and I want to ask you to come for a couple of things. Number one, if you or someone you know is in a relationship that's not honoring to the Lord, that first point, number well, it's number three today, but that marriage is honorable, and, and we need to avoid fornication and adultery. Listen, I know there's a, a tremendous amount of sexual sin in the world right now. If, if you or someone you know is dealing with some things, why don't you come and set it right? Why don't you come and be reborn in this area? Why don't you come and you can just pray or preferably take a pastor or counselor by the hand and let us help you. Let us walk with you in doing this God's way and getting God's blessing. I know sometimes, well, what will they think if I come forward? Who cares, man? Who cares? People don't think about you as much as you think they think about you. One of the things we all struggle with is pride, and we think people think about us a lot. Truth is they don't. And you coming to pray could be for you, could be for someone else, but I know we have some pain in this area. I know we have some sin to deal with in this area. Why don't we just lay it before the Lord and be done with it? 
and not pick it up and take it out of the room. We would love to help you. Okay, so Siri's talking to me now. Look, God already knows. Why don't you come clean and get right? If also there is any sense in you that, you know, I I struggle with comparison and coveting and looking at what this guy's got or what that guy's got, listen, let that go. When you have Christ, you have all that you need. When you have Christ, you have absolutely everything you need. So please, just let it go and trust the Lord. I I feel like today some people need to come and lay some things down. And I know there are some folks that need to come and intercede. Somebody in your friend group or family is hurting or struggling or out of God's will. And the last thing I want is for them to see the judgment of God. You don't want to experience that. You don't want them to experience that. You want to see the mercies of God. But the reality is some preachers never ever want to talk about the judgment of God. It is a real thing. And you don't want to be under that judgment. So come. Come for you, come for others, but come. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the truth of your word. In these final exhortations of Hebrews, it seems like we're hopping around a bit, but the writer's saying, look, this is important too. And don't forget this. He's not ever asking us to go back into religious ritual. He's saying, have a real relationship that really changes your life. It really changes your marriage. It it really changes the way you look at the stuff in the world. Because the stuff isn't getting us to glory. The Savior gets us to glory. Thank you for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Come on, guys. The altar's open. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for? with this before I called Brian up. A number of times in Florida, I met um, some older folks in our 
church family that were living together and unmarried. It was interesting to me because I really had never seen that where I grew up. And, and of course, I would say to them, why don't you let us walk you through counseling and let's, let's, you need to be in God's covenant of marriage. I mean, you're adults. If you're living together, I assume. And they were like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was assuming right. I said, well, why don't you get this right and do it God's way? Well, pastor, you don't understand. We lose benefits, and then they'd start spouting like tax stuff and government stuff. And if they got married, they would be worse off financially. And I want to say to you, if you are that far from God, you need to straighten up and fly right. If you think Uncle Sam is more important than King Jesus, you got a problem. And you need to repent. And I told some folks, made some mad and some got right with the Lord and got married later in life. But I said, look, do you believe that God not only is the owner of the cattle on a thousand hills, but the hills themselves? And they'd say, well, yeah. But do you not think God can take care of you according to his riches and glory? People will use every excuse in the book. Well, we gotta live together, preacher. We gotta try things out and see if we're compatible. You never know, even in the bedroom. We gotta know if we're compatible. Are you a dude? Is she a lady? You're compatible. You got me. I didn't say a dude, dude, or a lady, lady. I said, if you're a dude and she's a lady, God made you compatible. Get over it. Help your own life in being obedient. Help yourself by just surrendering and being obedient, saying, you know, I'm going to go talk to one of those pastors. Counselors and pastors will be here. Cindy and I are back there. You can certainly talk to us. You don't have to go all the way through to get to us. Talk to somebody. We want you to set it right because we don't want to see judgment on you. We don't want to see judgment on your kids. We want you to do this God's way, and you're not too far. He said, but pastor, we've lived together 20 years. Common law, I could care less about common law. I could care less about what the Supreme Court calls marriage. The Bible tells me what this is. The Bible tells me God's standards. And I would encourage you, let us love you in this way. Let us help you in this way. Just felt like you needed to hear that today. I don't know. And maybe it's somebody listening out there. Reach out to us. And if you're not in the area, we'll find a good church in your area. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being generous as always. One of the ways that we know that people in our church are maturing in the faith is because you just continue to be so incredibly generous with time, talent, and treasure. We know it's all God's. Any good thing we have, he gave us. So thank you for giving it back to the work of the ministry. Again, pray for Romania and Pastor Brian. Close us out, my friend. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. We all show your appreciation to Pastor Bobby for sharing the truth this morning, for preaching faithfully. just want to remind you, uh, before you leave, if the Lord is working on you, just like Pastor said, we're going to have pastors and counselors to my left, your right, down here after the service. We would love to meet with you, talk with you, pray with you, uh, but please do not leave this place. If, if God is stirring, you know, just in our grace group during this hour, we talked about John 4 and the woman at the well, who had a lot of brokenness, but Jesus' response was, I'm here to give you living water, grace. So if you're in this category, it's not just the grace to save us, it's the grace that we need daily to sustain us. We love to pray over you and help you work, walk through those things. Pastor Bobby and Miss Cindy will also be here. Uh, if you're a guest with us today or if you have not spoken with them or not spoken in a long time, they would love to meet you at the kiosk out here to my left, your right as well. Please come forward and see them. Uh, and then I want to talk to the men real quick. I've got an announcement for you. You know, I think the Lord is gracious uh, to give us brothers. And it's hard to find guys that have brothers in the faith to help walk alongside of them. So we have several ways for you to get involved in men's ministry here. We've got Men of the Word that meets every Monday at 6.30 in the morning, studying through the Word. We've got grace groups. But I also have a way for those of you that maybe you just need an easier on-ramp that is maybe slightly violent. And so that is clay shooting on May 4th. Um, That is Star Wars Day. Pastor Mike said he won't be there because it's Star Wars Day. If that's you... Bring your baby Yoda and come to clay shooting. We want you to be there. Uh, We're going to meet at 8 a.m. on that Saturday. The cost is $45. We're going to have a devotion. We'll share the gospel, and we'll have fun. And so if you need to get connected, if you want to have fun on that day, if you have somebody that maybe they wouldn't come to church, but you know they need Jesus, and they would come to this. Invite them to this. This is a great tool. Maybe you pay their way. 
right? So you can go to gracebc.org slash men to register for that coming up on May 4th. Uh, and we would love to have you there and jump into all that God is doing with our men. So um, let me pray for you and then you'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, and God, I thank you for the reminder that Jesus is better. His ways are better. They're better than sin. They're better than the satisfaction the world might offer us. They're better than wealth and riches. It is better to lose it all and to have Christ. So God, if you are dealing with anyone in this room, would they not leave this place before surrendering it before you again. Daily surrender, covered in the grace that Christ's death, his resurrection makes possible to us. There are no perfect people here. There's just forgiven people and people that need to be forgiven. So would we surrender it all to you again today and be salt and light as we leave this place. God, we love you. We thank you for the grace in Jesus. We pray this in his name, amen, amen. You are dismissed.